Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Hmm. Apologies for the uh, semi-chaotic bell chime there. I'm in a slightly different position this morning because it's already 8.15. Uh, I don't know. I had to take a shower this morning, but I, I don't know why I got behind. Shouldn't have. <laughs> Shouldn't have. Did. We all know how that goes. What is time? Ah, Today is Monday, August 16th. Ah, coffee tastes delicious. Yeah, so I just got over a little so that I wouldn't be facing into the sun. And I'm also sniffly this morning. For some reason, my allergies are wanting to go today. What are you? Little gnat hovering here. Thought it was a spider at first, the way it was hanging so still in midair. So let's see. Um... Here I am back again after a uh, brief hiatus. I don't know. Does a hiatus have to be a particular amount of time? Um, I missed a couple days. Seems like hiatus is a strong word for that. But I warned you guys. Um, so yeah, we took the grandkids to Waterworld on Thursday and uh, drove back on Friday and I just, um, yeah, I was kind of doing well to just get those things done. <laughs> I'm tightening the strap on my sandals for those of you on video. <sighs> and sniffing, sniffling, in case you wondered what I'm doing. See my cute little sandals? They're cute, but I'm sliding them around, sliding around in them. So I have uh, cleverly deduced that I need to tighten the strap. We'll see if that <coughs> works. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeez, I don't know why my sinuses are going crazy this morning. It was very smoky in Denver. It's fortunately not smoky here, which is a relief. But um, boy, Denver was smoky. They had a big um, inversion going anyway, as Denver does in the summertime. Uh, I grew up there, you know, and um, I remember those summer inversions. It's a trick of the landscape, not entirely Denver's fault, but um, having forest fires and the enormous population they've got going now um, is exacerbating the problem. That helps. I'm going to have to do the other shoe. Is that annoying watching me do this? Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. It's better than making an effort not to scratch my eyes, which is what I really want to be doing. <sighs> well, this other shoe's almost, they were on different holes on the straps. <sighs> so, so, um, so yeah, it was a good trip. It was, uh, yeah, nice to reconnect with the grandkids. Hadn't seen them since before the pandemic. And then driving back on Friday, uh, I did almost all of the driving on the way back. So there was no working in the car. And so even though we left early, by the time we got home, um, and I maybe could have worked, but I was just tired. I was just brain dead. And so I decided to just treat the whole thing as a little vacation from the book. And this week I need to crank it because next week I'm going on vacation yet again. Lately, there's more vacation than working. That's how it feels anyway. <sighs> so, um, yeah, I mostly just did like um, relaxing and businessy stuff over the weekend. I considered adding another day of writing and um, to make up for the lost days. But I thought, well, if I could do five solid days this week, that's ideal. So that's what I'm striving for. 
we were talking in the CIFWA Slack some about um, in the writing accountability channel just about writing rituals and routines and stuff and uh, someone was talking about how uh, they go for scenes instead of word count because if they have a word count goal don't mind me <laughs> Ah, something must be blooming all of a sudden. Could be smoke. I suspect the chemise are starting to bloom. And I am out in the garden. So, um, what was I saying? Now I started thinking about allergies. I was going to tell you guys I have friends who like, who have allergies who don't go outside. And I'm like, this is not a sacrifice I'm willing to make. I'm going to be out here in the garden anyway. So, I was going to say something about that. <laughs> Getting five days. Oh, writing rituals. That some people um, go for scenes instead because if they go for a word count goal, they end up like really padding and getting raggedy, <laughs> which I could totally see. I, and I have had friends who are um, established authors, um, novelists who work the same way for the same reason. So it's worth mentioning. And I think that the, um, the way to know is in your developmental edits, in your revision process, do you cut or do you add? Which, which thing do you need to do? Particularly, which thing does uh, a professional editor tell you to do? For me, revisions are 95% of the time with a couple of salient exceptions. Um, and those were because I started in the wrong place. The rest of the time, it's adding. I'm always adding. So for me, going for word count makes a lot of sense because I tend to be a concise writer anyway. Um, you know, like even when I was getting my PhD in science, you know, like my thesis was like the shortest one that the department had produced. <laughs> And it wasn't because there wasn't good information in there, people. But it was because, um, yeah, I just tend to be a concise writer. Uh, I don't take a lot of time to say something. And, yeah, and, and so my edits are almost always... Um, <sighs> excuse me, I'm really sorry. This is probably obnoxious. Um that my edits are always, uh, can you give reaction here? Can you explain more? Can you describe? Um, this feels like it goes too fast. <laughs> Gracious. Geez, I even made the chimes ring with that one. So, um, so yeah, but that is one way. If you tend to be someone who, and I have friends who do this too, who like write, 200,000 words for a 100,000 word novel. So they have to cut like half. And um, if you tend to be that writer, uh, go through and <laughs> if you tend to be that soldier, is what I want to say, uh, tend, go through and consider working in scenes instead of um, word count. It's one way to do it, to make yourself, uh, confine yourself from sprawling. Uh, that's why a lot of people like to pre-plot because they think it keeps them from sprawling too. And so people ask me that a lot, you know, like, how do I keep the book, uh, to a particular storyline? How do I keep it from wandering off into other places if, if I don't pre-plot? I don't know. I think it's just how my brain works. I think it's for the same reason that I'm a concise writer. I think I just tend to, I cleave close to the point <laughs> everywhere except on this podcast. <laughs> um, what I was saying, um, if you're that soldier, it was making me think of that my assistant, Kareen, who is Dutch, has pointed out that a very common typo that she sees in English books. And she learned English entirely so that she could read uh, books, especially ones that like where they had been the first book in the series or the first couple books in the series had been translated to English. 
and then or translated to Dutch and then the rest were not and she wanted to continue the series so she had to uh, learn English so she could find out what happens which is I think the best reason to learn a language um, that and to communicate with the king that you just happen to be married to accidentally but that's uh, that's how it goes bye um, so but one thing that she has noticed is that uh, a common typo is instead of soldier uh, that people tend to have solider so in English soldier is S O L D I E R but sometimes people write it as solider S O L I D E R and they almost never mean solider but because solider is a word it doesn't get picked up as easily and apparently American eyes go right past it but it stands out to her uh, so every once in a while she sends me um, a screenshot of when someone actually meant solider so that's a good one to check for if you have your little checklist of words which I do um, that you tend to misspell that make it through spell check um, homonyms like that or crutch words that's a good one to check for but I even have a couple of notes today notes um one of them is this trope that I've been noticing lately is that I have been you know sometimes you wonder is it that you've become sensitive to it or is there a preponderance of it which thing is it um, so this could be something of both but I have noticed in a couple of recent books and now I've seen it at least three times recently and it could be more often than that but um, yeah three books recently one might have been imitating the first uh, which can happen you know like uh, because the first book did quite well and the second book was in the same genre and so it could have been a case of oh I really like that trope or I like that device and then I saw it in another book in a totally different genre and it's a device that I am not really excited about but what happens is is there will be a scene where the ex-girlfriend or otherwise conniving female strips naked and gets the guy into a compromising position now in the first two cases the ex-girlfriend had um, turned up naked in his apartment in his bed you know and and we see this sometimes right you know like where the the hero it happens in movies you know he walks into his bedroom and there is the naked woman in his bed and she's you know like you can't resist me and he's like no I can't I can't resist you but then the the heroine walks in and she's like ah, let me assume the worst of you uh, there are reasons why I don't like this device so yeah it's the she strips herself naked in an attempt to uh, coerce him in some way and this results in either a massive understanding or dislike of the woman and so one of the reasons that I dislike this trope trope or device I think it's more of a device than a trope uh, a trope is a storytelling element a device is like a, a tool right a tool so what we're trying to do is show that this woman is a really bad woman right I mean that's the the intent of of the device so that we dislike her um, the ex-girlfriend has to do something slutty and shameful and manipulative so that we dislike her and <coughs> hang on a sec okay there uh, yeah she has to do something slutty and shameful so that we dislike her so that we know that she is a bad person tm uh, and then 
I don't like it because it's a device for that only succeeds if there's miscommunication. In the third case where I saw it recently, it was a totally different genre and it was um, not resulting in a misunderstanding, but it was meant to demonstrate that the woman was, was bad and evil. And I think it bothers me because there's this, I think, underlying misogyny there uh, that if a woman strips herself naked and makes that be a sexual invitation that this is evil of her that she um that she has no shame that she is immodest there's a lot of programmed misogyny that shows up in books especially in regards to competition with other women and i think that it's something for us to be really careful of because a lot of that is so stereotypical and cliche, but comes mainly from stories. It doesn't come from real life because I will ask you, those of you who have dated someone who had an ex-girlfriend, um, we could even limit it to men. Those of you who have dated men who had an ex-girlfriend, how often has it happened to you or to a friend that the ex-girlfriend stripped herself naked in order to tempt the guy back for me never never i have dated men who have had exes who attempted to get them back that was not the method that they used um you know flirting talking uh the i need you is is a big one um you know like my my husband's ex-wife that was a a very common gambit of hers and and one of his ex-girlfriends too that they would call him up crying and be like oh i i need your help only you can help me with this um if there's children involved it becomes even more fraught but none of them strip themselves naked uh, and in the other case where you know like the attempt to seduce a guy I don't know. I just have never, <laughs> I certainly, I've never done it. I mean, that's not, if I were really interested in seducing a guy, which I mean, I've certainly chased men before, but I never used the strip myself naked device. So I guess I'm going to vote that we just ditched this device. I just don't think, I don't think it's useful. I don't think it's relevant. I think it's a lazy crutch and I think it perpetuates a, a stereotype that, um, is it based on anything at all? You know, some stereotypes are based on things. Um, they're, you know, people, I've even heard people say things like, well, you know, it's a stereotype because it's true or, you know, it's a cliche because it's real. And that right there is, you could argue with that, but, um, especially stuff that, comes out of sort of the storytelling canon uh, and especially something that's as misogynistic as that you can have a woman who a female character who is conniving and manipulative uh, without um, shaming her for getting herself naked and being sexy thus endeth the sermon and uh, on that note Wish me luck getting uh, 15K this week. I need it. I'm a little past 50,000. So maybe we can do it. Uh, I will remind you all that First Cup of Coffee is part of the Frolic Media Podcast Network. And you will find more podcasts that you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.